Great. So the first bill is House File 1849. I think I've seen Chair Hornstein in the audience. And would someone care to move House File 1849? Represent, uh, Representative Carlson moves House File 1849 for possible inclusion into the uh, omnibus tax bill. And we do have an A. One amendment, so Representative Carlson uh, moves the A1 amendment. And it looks to be um, pretty minor in nature. Any discussion on the A1 amendment? Not, I'm going to call for the vote. Uh, all those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The motion does prevail. The A1 amendment is adopted. Um, Good morning, Representative Hornstein. Welcome to the committee. And uh, please describe your bill. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Marcourt, for uh, hearing House File 1849. I was just talking with uh, uh, the, the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee that uh, uh, Representative Carlson reminded me that this is sort of a, an annual rite of spring, uh, just like uh, potholes and bill deadlines. Uh, I think I've had a version of this bill just about every uh, term I've served. And the reason I do this bill, and, and maybe like the hands free bill, this could be the year, Mr. Chair. This could be the year oh, no. uh, where this is in law. In law. Um, but uh, the reason I do this bill um, is that uh, uh, I find it uh, concerning that we have uh, companies uh, here uh, headquartered in Minnesota that uh, do hide their money in overseas tax havens. And while the numbers uh, of, of ta the, the number of, the amount of revenue isn't nearly as much as the, that we've seen at the federal level, uh, it's still uh, money that should be repatriated here in Minnesota. You know, at, on the national tax bill, uh, I found it uh, very encouraging uh, that both parties uh, address this practice uh, by uh, doing something what, that's called deemed repatriation. And they recognized that there was so much revenue uh, that was being <laughs> hidden overseas that we needed to, to grab this revenue and bring it back to the United States Treasury coffers. And so this bill would do the same in Minnesota. And uh, there's always a lot of interest in um, uh, Section 2, Subdivision 5C, um, and that is, of course, the uh, definition of tax haven. And that comes to us from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. And so this is the current list of tax havens. Um, when I brought this bill, this bill did make it to the floor and passed off the floor, um, I believe, in uh, 2007 or so. And at that time, uh, Laura Broad was the uh, uh, lead for the uh, GOP on taxes. And I knew I probably couldn't go toe to toe with her on um, some of the fine points of tax policy. But when she asked me to yield, I, I got quite nervous. But the question wasn't about the definition of unitary taxation or anything like that. It was, well, uh, Representative Hornstein, Barbados should not be on the list. And in fact, she was right. Uh, we had to delete Barbados, and Barbados is still not on the list, Mr. Chair. So. Uh, that, that is really the bill. Um, I know in the past, I don't have a fiscal note, and maybe uh, the staff can help me out, but this comes out to about, uh, I think, either $38 million uh, per biennium or, or annually. Uh, and I, I do believe that's money that should be going into our general fund. It's money that should be helping our schools, should be going to assist with health care, and all the other things that we spend money on here in the state of Minnesota. So. And with that, I'd be happy to uh, stand for questions. But this is just a, a simple way to um, repatriate money that is going in these tax havens. And by the way, uh, Mr. Chair and members, you know, they're, they're hidden there because, you know, these uh, are, are jurisdictions that have no nominal taxes uh, and, um, you know, operate with very little transparency, uh, quite a bit of secrecy. And so I just don't think this is right. I just don't think this practice is right, and um, and this is money that uh, uh, should. You know, we have hardworking Minnesotans that are paying their taxes, and I think these companies should do the same, and not hide their money in these uh, quite exotic locations. If you, 
if you want to take a vacation. A journalist once said that they wanted to cover the story so they could travel to all these places. But um, the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, the Cook Islands, um, some very interesting locations around the globe, Mr. Chair. Very good. Before we uh, go to some questions here, there is a revenue estimate, and it would show a revenue gain of about $85 million over the 2021 budget. So this hasn't really changed over the years. Um, it's kind of what I had thought it would be. Very good. Chair Davids. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Chair Marquardt. I'm not sure how there can be a revenue note on this bill. Uh, Chair Hornstein is amazing. He's been very, very persistent. Uh, and we've been doing this for many, many years, and I think he has frightened all of these countries, especially Liechtenstein, <laughs> to uh, not be a tax haven and open up for transparency. So, members, uh, the, the list in my good friend Chair Hornstein's bill doesn't exist. Uh, they are all in compliance with transparency acts, and so I'm not sure how we're gaining revenue. I mean, I pulled all my money out of these countries. <laughs> Um, I have none in any of these countries. And so, Mr. Chair, how, maybe House Research, how do we go forward and how can there be a, a revenue note when none of these countries, there is no list. There wasn't 2000. Today there is no list. Uh, and I passed out the fact that they have improved the establishing effective exchange uh, information tax matters. There is no list of tax havens today. So. Maybe the fiscal person could explain to me how there can be a revenue note when there's nobody on the list. Mr. Chairman. I don't, very good. I, I don't know if that's, if there's anyone fiscally that could answer that or not. Um, I don't see anyone coming forward on that. Uh, oh, Ms. Templin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess my question, Ms. Templin, is these are no longer tax havens. Um, Ms. Templin, uh, Mr. how did you come up with that number? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative David, Cynthia Templin, House Fiscal Staff. Um, what you have is the Department of Revenue's estimate before you um, with the estimated revenue gain. And what I can tell you is just what's on the revenue estimate, and they use the uh, the experience of a couple other states that had tax havens to um, to scale the estimate to Minnesota. Well, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Ms. Templin, uh, Chair Davids, it's magic. There are no countries on the list of tax havens at this time. So how can we generate revenue from a list that doesn't exist? Uh, Ms. Templin, um, Mr. Chair, Representative Davids, uh, the estimate again just works with the experience of other states. Um, I can go back and get some more information, or I know the department is here as well and is probably um, fluent in kind of the experience of tax havens if, um, if necessary. Well, Mr. So, Chairman, can Chair, someone so, so Chair department? Davids, yes, uh, so I, I see under subdivision 5C, there's a list of tax havens in the bill. So. And I, I see what I have from Chair Davis, 38 jurisdictions will have made commitments to implement. And I, I don't know how that factors into this for sure. Uh, Mr. Chair. Chair Dave, Ms. Templin. I do know that Oregon, um, the state of Oregon has had tax havens and did collect revenue as well um, <laughs> from tax havens when they were in place. Um, so. Well, and they had a list. Uh, Representative Hornstein. Uh, Monta uh, Mr. Chair, Montana did as well. Uh, and um, I, I think you make a good point, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, the, the OECD is the gold standard, and they have a list of tax havens. That's where this uh, language comes from. And the, and the list does change. It does change. You know, some countries then comply. Other countries are added. Um, you know, there's a few. Uh, when we did get this bill, on the floor, there was a bit of concern. Um, the ambassador from Luxembourg wrote a note uh, to us, uh, uh, concerned that um, they were on the list, but uh, you know, tried to argue that they weren't. The ambassador from Latvia actually came from Washington to talk with me, 
and we had someone from the Council General's office and uh, from the United Kingdom from Chicago came up to talk with me because all of these islands in the uh, English Channel are tax havens. So, um, you know, this isn't a concern. It is a debate in international economic development circles. But I hold by the OECD. And as I said, there were a number of countries that were on the list in 2007 that are not on the list now. But then there's other countries that are, that are pretty consistent, you know, uh, and, and they've been on the list for years. Yeah, Representative Hornsey, I do think some countries were removed off of the black list, if you will. Correct. But states like in your bill would still say these are tax havens Correct. and develop Correct, their Mr. own list, basically, yep. of tax havens. Yeah, so they come Chair, and go. Yeah, yeah. Chair Davids. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like uh, my good friend Chair Hornstein to consider a friendly amendment to, to reword the language, say, current list of tax havens according to the OECD. Because, Mr. Chair and members, in May of 2009, the Committee on Fiscal Affairs decided to remove all three remaining jurisdictions, Andorra, Principality of Liechtenstein, and the Principality of Monaco, from the list of uncooperative tax havens in the light of their commitments and, and on and on. You, you've got the document that I passed Thanks. out. So, I think it would be a reasonable amendment to say, you know, Chair Hornstein has said the OECD is kind of the, uh, what we go by. I think we should uh, go with the countries that the OECD has on their list uh, as tax havens and leave it at that because we are, you know, we're getting it. This probably needs to be re-referred to the International Affairs Committee uh, because we're uh, dealing in international affairs here. And I think that we've got a whole bunch of countries here that aren't even on the list that we're going to consider passing a bill. Well, I, I don't think we really are, but but we're going to be considering passing a bill, putting countries on a list for tax havens that are not tax havens. So if the if Chair Hornstein would consider a friendly amendment that we have a current list updated every two years uh, for tax havens, and then the bill would apply to those tax havens as according to the OECD. So. Representative Hornstein. Um, Mr. Chair, um, I uh, uh, believe that uh, given what happened uh, at the federal level uh, with the deemed repatriation, uh, perhaps there is a, a perhaps Representative Davids, if uh, this bill is being laid over, I understand, correct? That's uh, correct. Long so uh, I would suggest that uh, we work together to, to come up with perhaps an accurate list and maybe the the list of companies that uh, or or uh, countries that uh, were uh, identified in the federal tax act uh, it, it, which you know is very recent that's uh, just within the last 18 months or so uh, the countries that were identified there as tax havens where we're getting the deemed rape repatriation from you know may be a good compromise uh, in terms of how to identify the proper countries. Well, Representative Hornstein, the European Union has a list also. In fact, I'm Representative yeah. Brand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Hornstein, I just looked, I just Googled real quick, and um, there's a report by the European Union that lists a whole bunch of different countries that are on this list already as well as transgressors for, uh, for uh, <laughs> tax uh, havens. And also, the European Union cites the, the the, the word of the day around here is transparency. This is good tax transparency to have this list. And so I guess I would agree with this bill. Representative Carlson. Yeah, I was just going to um, <clears throat> mention I happened to uh, watch uh, 60 Minutes last Sunday. And the focus, uh, about 25% of their program was on Monaco and uh, what a tax haven it is. That was the main thrust of the, uh, the story, if anybody who happened to watch it the uh, wealth that uh, goes into Monaco and uh, it, uh, some of the, even some of the scenes and the uh, cost of housing and so on that's there because it's a tax haven. Um, it's like one square mile, I think is what they said on the program is, uh, is what the principality is. Uh, totally independent and uh, has been for several hundred years, but it's been a tax haven for generations, maybe hundreds of years, but uh, the yachts and the uh, huge apartments that are there for millions and millions of dollars per per apartment, but uh, people gravitate there for the uh, tax advantages. Chair Davids. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair Marcourt. And to bring up the European Union in this discussion is 
a bit odd. Uh, last I looked, we were not members of the European Union. Uh, we, as Chair Hornstein has said, the gold standard is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, and there are no tax havens left. Um, you know, not even Great Britain is going to be in the European Union for, well, maybe they will be. Hard, hard, hard to say, but why would we bring the European Union in the discussion <coughs> when we are not members of the European Union? It doesn't affect us. The gold standard is, is the OECD, uh, and there's no one on the list. This is just bizarre. I mean, Chair Hornstein has been so, like I said, has been so tremendously successful. He has just scared these countries into submission, uh, <laughs> and they are now being transparent and doing what they should have been doing the whole time. So I thank Chair Hornstein for his past bills, uh, that got us to this point where we have, according to the OECD, we have no tax havens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Representative Schultz. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I would like clarification maybe from the Department of Revenue um, about what a difference in commitment is versus actually implementing um, that commitment. Yeah, it, well, I don't, Representative Schultz, I don't know if, I mean, this isn't with the Department of Revenue, it's the OECD, so I don't know if they'd be able to determine that necessarily. But in the bill here, Representative Hornstein does not refer to the OECD. No, that's... It's, I mean, you've, you've mentioned that, but in the, in the bill wording, there's no reference to that. It's just the list of yeah. tax havens. Is that correct? Correct. And, um, and, and again, I think... Mr. Chair and uh, members, uh, Representative Schultz raises a good issue, a, a commitment versus, you know, uh, uh, a actual transparency being met is, is different. And Representative Carlson is absolutely correct. I mean, to, to state that there are no tax havens in the world is, is just, um, I just don't think that reflects reality. Um, and uh, if we need to be looking at an up, updated list or a different list I'm, I'm certainly open to that but um, uh, you know perhaps it could be the list that our own United States Department of Treasury you know has identified uh, related to the tax bill from two years ago because we are getting deemed repatriation we are getting money repatriated from various uh, tax havens and that's the goal mr. chair that is the goal all conversation aside our goal is to make sure that uh, money that is being hidden by Minnesota corporations overseas comes back to Minnesota where we can put that revenue to work for our schools, for our uh, health care system, for public safety, for higher education, everything we fund in the general fund. Uh, that money shouldn't be sitting somewhere in the South Pacific or uh, the Caribbean. Chair Davids. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to Chair Hornstein, who compiled the list that you have in the bill? Representative Hornstein. Uh, I believe that um, you know, this is a list that uh, has been, uh, again, with some additions and deletions over the years, uh, was uh, 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 <laughs> compiled by um, House Research, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm, I think they're the gold standard, I think, in many ways, uh, in terms of uh, identifying tax havens. Well, Mr. Chair Chairman Dave. and Chair Hornstein, where did House Research get their information? Well, my understanding, Mr. again, is, uh, my understanding, and, uh, uh, and we, we could talk to them, but uh, in the past, um, uh, Mr. Michael has, has looked at the, uh, I, I believe, the OECD list, but I could be, I could be mistaken, but well, I, I know in the past he's looked at that list. Thank, uh, Chair, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Chair Hornstein is from the OECD and the Internal Revenue Service. And for the record, I never said, I, don't hear, I didn't hear anyone say that there are no tax havens in the world. I have found a few that are not on this list, but I'm not aware, uh, I, we never said there are no tax havens in the world. Obviously, there are. It's just that this list that doesn't exist anymore, well, it's just interesting. It's not, we, well, whatever. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I was curious as to see, you know, where the accuracy is, and, and I think I've heard uh, discussions about, well, the OC, OECD is, is the one that we should go to, so I, I pulled up their um, Automatic Exchange of Information Implementation Report for 2018, which is just last year, and in it, uh, it says here, um, all jurisdictions asked to commit to the Global Formal, Form, Forum's AEOI standard have now done so, except the United States. And, and
and so it, it, it appears that this OECD uh, that has is, is really looking for the transparency of the information, not whether or not they're tax havens. And so my question is maybe we're looking for the wrong right. values in the wrong forum in order to determine who's tax havens and whether or not we ought to be going after them. And so I, I just, I'm still confused as to what the bill does and, and where the, the value is and, and whether or not it works. Mm -hmm. I understand that in law you can create any list you want and just uh, just make in implications that they're tax havens, uh, whether they are or not, and, and that will impact, of course, tax policy, and it will impact dollars coming in because you're now treating them differently than others. But, but to say that there's a, a report out there that said these are uncooperative and tax havens is probably incorrect. Uh, and so I think just going on to their website that this, at least the information here says that it's referring to, uh, apparently doesn't exist anymore, or at least everything has been corrected. So maybe we're just dealing with outdated information as well, Mr. Chair. So thank you. Representative Fabian. I'll pass, Mr. Chair. We do have a couple testifiers, and we can come back um, on this too. So uh, Ms. Larson, I think I have first on the list. Please state welcome and please state your name. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. I'm Jill Larson with the Minnesota Business Partnership. We do have some concerns about this bill, um, as you've heard in the past. One of them is that it seems to arbitrarily impose additional Minnesota taxes on businesses simply um, based on where they choose to incorporate um, affiliated companies or where they choose to do business. Um, as been, has been mentioned, um, there is only one other state in the country that has this type of a blacklist approach, and that is Montana. Um, the bill also imposes mandatory worldwide unitary combined reporting by taxing income that hasn't been earned in Minnesota or in the U.S. Um, several years ago, many years ago, when other states tried to impose worldwide reporting, um, it created very strong objections to our foreign trading partners, and the solution was the Water's Edge election, which is um, something that Minnesota currently has. Um, unfortunately, this proposal would force Minnesota taxpayers to include income earned outside the U.S., and there would be no Water's Edge election. As has been discussed by the committee, this list of tax havens um, that was uh, originally drafted by the OECD many years ago no longer exists. Uh, my understanding from my research is that the OECD no longer maintains a list of tax haven countries. And uh, the U.S. Department of Treasury, a few years ago, under the former administration, uh, opposes listing countries as tax havens or blacklisting specific countries. I quote from a Department of Treasury letter, some excerpts, there is no agreed upon definition of tax haven or a list of jurisdictions that should be considered tax havens because any such list is likely to be regarded as a blacklist and may be used as the basis for negative measures. Such a list may inappropriately negatively affect our economic and other relations with listed countries. So as Minnesota is trying, the end of quote, as Minnesota is trying to improve exports and trade and increase foreign direct investment in our state, this proposal will likely be opposed by and could even produce retaliatory action by our trading partners. As Representative Hornstein has mentioned, we have received letters from um, other consulates in past years uh, expressing deep concerns about this proposal. And uh, this also has some constitutional concerns. Um, Congress has the exclusive right to regulate commerce with foreign countries and to the extent that states impact the federal government's ability to speak with one voice in foreign affairs, um, there is a possible viol violation of the Foreign Commerce Clause. So thank you for um, your time. Thank you. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question for the testifier. So you mentioned that um, Montana has passed this legislation, similar legislation. Have they experienced retaliation by other countries in terms of trade? Mr. Ms. Chairman. Representative, I think that they have received letters from the consulates. I, I have seen some um, um, articles and documents from Montana where um, there's been discussions in the past about repealing that bill. They have received letters from different consulates. There's been discussion about taking countries off, putting countries on. So I think that they have, they have seen something similar. 
you know, Montana is not probably as much of a of a global commerce state as, as Minnesota is. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But have you have you have do you have any information on, on whether the trade that they do do has it been harmed or jeopardized because they passed legislation? So uh, have other countries retaliated against the state of Montana? Ms. Mr. Larson. Mr. Chair, Representative. I, I, I can do some more checking for you. I, don't, I haven't seen exact retaliation. Like I said, they have um, sent letters of concern, and and um, and uh, I don't know the exact impact on Montana's economy. But as I said, I think their economy is less uh, focused in terms of the number of Fortune 500 companies that are there, as opposed to Minnesota. Representative Gomez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And kind of in that same vein on the Montana law, because you cite possible constitutional issues, have there been any constitutional challenges to Montana's law? And if so, have those been sustained in the courts? Uh, Ms. Larson. Mr. Chairman, Representative, um, I'll have to check on that. Their, their law has been in effect for a while. It's changed a bit over the years. There's been um, changes in um, added countries and taking countries off, so I, I can check for you. Representative Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But it seems that, that you were citing kind of like that the, the idea of maintaining a list was had constitutional issues. So just to say, if, if the law has stood since 2004 when it was implemented, I just don't see how that is um, a valid argument against implementing something like this. Um, and I, I just, I think it's interesting that we're, we're kind of having a lot of discussions about the specific list or the, you know, kind of what the, who we're going to rely on to constitute this list, which is actually like outlined really clearly in the legislation. Uh, um, but it's just to say that this is a practice that is happening. This is, is a way that, that the largest, most powerful corporations with the richest CEOs, the most enriched shareholders in the world are are using, you know, kind of uh, <clears throat> beneficial tax arrangements in other in other countries to not to not pay their fair share of taxes in the country where the, where they're doing business, where where the public invests in, in 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 education for their workers, in roads for them to move their goods around, and so and so this is just a, a an issue of basic fairness, and I just don't want us to lose sight of of the fact that this is a practice that is happening. To Chair, to Chair Hornstein's point, right, this is a practice that's happening, and it was acknowledged in, in the TCJA, which is why they, there's deemed repatriation and, we're cha and, they're, and they changed the policy on, on guilty. Um, so, you know, we can argue about, like, where's the list coming from, what's the right composition of the list, but the point <laughs> remains that, that this, is, this is an issue, it's something that's happening, and it is... Directly, d directly related to the issues that we're facing as a state in terms of having to make choices about whether we're going to, you know, fix our crumbling infrastructure or fix our, our special ed cross subsidy. Though that that's the implication of this. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair, da did you want to Chair Davids? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of things here. First of all. Uh, some years ago we did hear the bill this bill on tax committee but what we're doing here is we're forming a blacklist just so we know um, there we this bill is calling them tax havens when the OECD and the IRS are not I, I believe that's just a bit bizarre what I would like to do on this forming of this blacklist I'd like to hear from the Department of Revenue at some point mr. chairman I want to know if they support this bill we can we can certainly call them up towards the end here. So, uh, any other? All right. So, good morning. Good Welcome. Morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Beth Kadoon. I represent the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I believe Ms. Larson really covered the testimony quite well, so we agree with her comments. Just want to make sure I go on the record that the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce does oppose this legislation as well. Um, we do believe, based on the discussion today, you can see this is really a very complicated area, kind of a lack, I believe, the expertise within the state to determine um, what countries are tax havens or not. Um, there's also a letter that was um, distributed to you from COS, the Council of State Taxation. 
Um, that does mention as, as well that Oregon just repealed their tax haven law. And I think they point out, and I think that's very instructive as well, which is California has gone down this path, looked at this legislation and similar approach, and decided not to impose tax haven <laughs> legislation. So you're seeing other, um, I would say, higher tax states, such as California, New York, others who have a very large corporate presence who have decided not to go down this path, and we would urge you as well um, not to include it in the final omnibus tax bill. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Kadoon? Uh, before I call the Department of Revenue down, is there anyone else here uh, in the audience that would like to testify for or against House File 1849 <coughs> as amended? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Bears? Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Um, at this, our, my name is Joanna Bears. I'm the legislative director for the Department of Revenue. At this time, we're not um, prepared to take a policy stance on on the issue, but uh, we can follow up and have just, you know further discussions with the author about some language that we could in include if it moves forward. Chair Davids. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I noticed in Governor Wallace's budget proposal that. Uh, he doesn't support forming a blacklist on these, our friends and neighbors in these various countries here. But I do remember, uh, Chair Hornstein, you're exactly right. When we heard your bill, I got letters, and they're really cool return addresses. They're like yeah. gold or silver. <laughs> they're, they're, they're really cool from Liechtenstein. Remember yeah. that one? Yeah. And, and we got quite a few of those, actually, and I saved them all. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative, uh, anything further for, the, for Ms. Bears? Thank you, Ms. Bears. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and earlier we heard discussions about uh, all, all these rich companies with the richest CEOs. Um, do we have a list of those? Because I'd like to see what, what those are. And, and, and my question for further discussion, uh, so then <clears throat> if, if you define it this way that, that Minnesota isn't getting our fair share of taxes because of tax haven countries, then we probably have tax haven states in the United States here too where the corporations are based in another state and pay taxes that way and is that where we're going next if if this continues going on so I mean I, I just think there are so many problems with us trying to develop uh, policy especially when it, it goes international policy in regards to our own taxing um, it, the thing that we ought to consider is is what is the rationale for people going to countries and states like that it's because we have kind of pushed them out with our policy issues in regards to taxes. And rather than, than always pointing to others and saying, hey, you know, you, what are you doing? Sometimes we need to look back to what our policies are ourselves and, and what the cause is. So I just think this is time for, for a pause and say, okay, it's a good idea to uh, always look at everything, but this probably isn't its day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And members, I appreciate the discussion. And whether or not it's this bill with tax havens, there is really a big concern uh, with the shifting of corporate profits from the United States to low or no tax countries. Uh, there really is. And in fact, in 2014, uh, companies had to report to the IRS where they had their foreign or earnings. And the number one country was Bermuda. They had $96 billion of profits there. And yet the entire GDP that's a total output of goods and services in Bermuda was six billion. So there was 16 times more profits in Bermuda than they had gross domestic product. And in the Cayman Islands, it was $40 billion of profits, the three billions of gross domestic product, which realistically is impossible they actually have more earnings than, than GDP in a nation. And there was actually five countries uh, that were that way. Uh, so, I mean, this is a problem, whether or not it's the tax havens or whether or not it's some other way. Uh, how big is the problem? The Congressional Budget Office in April of 2018, when they evaluated the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, said that because of this profit shifting that should probably come from the U.S., but is being shifted to other low-tax or no-tax countries, we're losing, the federal government's losing about $300 billion of business income a year, which equates to about $100 billion in revenue, they're estimating. And so how does that happen? 
Uh, it's about two different ways in which that happens according to the CBO. And one is what these multinational corporations will do. And by the way, this is all legal. I'm not, this is all legal. But what they will do is they will transfer their debt into, back to the U.S., a higher tax nation. Because with the debt comes the interest, which you then can deduct in a higher tax versus a low tax. And the other thing that they do is they transfer their intangible or intellectual properties, which could be copyrights, trademarks, patents, drug formulas, and they transfer those from higher tax nations to lower tax nations, therefore putting lower income in high tax areas and more income in, in, in low tax areas. And so uh, the IRS has a problem really tracking this because this intangible property has no physical or material existence, not like property or a piece of equipment. So it's easy for companies to move that around. And that's kind of caused, according to the CBO, that's probably the biggest reason for that $300 billion that is lost. So uh, Ms. Larson had mentioned that back in the 80s, there was 12 states that went to what was called a mandated worldwide combined reporting system, where you basically taxed everything that a company did around the world minus whatever they paid in taxes that country, so you weren't double taxation. And as Ms. Larson said, um, the multinational corporations and foreign governments went to Congress in the 80s and said, hey, we got to stop this practice. And that practice had been backed up with two Supreme Court cases that said it was constitutional. So President Reagan, in 1984, set up a task force. And the task force was run by his Treasury Secretary, Donald Regan, who said, OK, we're going to pressure these states to stop doing this worldwide practice. But this task force said, we're going to help states recoup some of this lost tax base. We're going to help them do that. Well, that was 1984. So they basically told the states, don't do this. The federal government said, we will help you. <laughs> And we will try to reduce this tax base erosion. That never occurred. In fact, they actually added to it when they did a, um, a repatriation holiday in 2004, where you brought back, uh, and about $300 billion of profits came back one time at a 5.25% rate instead of the then 35% rate. So that was the holiday part. Was not all that successful. But instead of actually giving local or states tools to combat this, they actually exasperated it by doing things that actually led that. So, so that leads us to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which they thought the federal government, this was a major concern, was this tax base erosion and the shifting of profits. Uh, so moving the tax rate, corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%, uh, they thought would lessen the incentives to go to lower tax, because you, you're lowering the tax and more comparable. But then the federal government did something just opposite of that. They moved from basically a worldwide system to a territorial system, which says now we no longer will tax any foreign income. And as Representative Hornstein said, with the deemed repatriation, what they did on a one-time basis, only one time, they said, OK, whether or not you bring the profits back or not, we're going to tax it. We're going to deem it like you brought it back. And so there's about $2.6, $2.7 trillion of profits that have been accumulated since 1986. And the CBO, or the Committee on Joint Taxation, estimates there's going to be about $338 billion of revenue brought back. But that's only one time. And once that gets brought back and taxed one time, until eternity, it will never be taxed again. And so there is one tool that the federal government gave us, and, and I think Representative Gomez, you mentioned that, was the Global Intangible Low Tax Income, or the guilty. And so that is the one tool, after 35 years, that they've given the states. I know we're not talking guilty today, but we're going to probably be talking about it later. It was in, in the governor's bill, is that this is one way for the states to try to recoup some of this lost revenue over all these years. And the fact of the matter is that you've got businesses that compete with these corporations that don't have the wherewithal to be able to shift profits. So they're literally paying more here in the United States, in Minnesota, because we're allowing other businesses to shift taxes on uh, and profits to Bermuda. 
And so, you know, our working families and our seniors and our farmers are paying more because we're allowing countries to shift profits to the Grand Cayman Islands. And so is it legal? Yes, we have good corporate partners here in Minnesota, but I don't think it's right and I don't think it's fair. You know, when we're struggling to finance education, which provides a very good workforce for our companies, we're struggling to do that, we should be recouping some of these dollars that have been lost. And I'm gonna kind of calculate, if it's $300 billion a year lost revenue in the US, at a 2% apportionment, that's maybe $6 billion of income that Minnesota has not been receiving every year. And if you apportion that down and so forth, I don't know what that equates to, but it could literally be hundreds if not billions of dollars over the last 35 years. So, you know, to kind of do this, and I don't know if the tax haven's the right way, and I know it's, I think it's the first day of spring, Representative Hornstein, and <laughs> with the right comes the tax havens. But, when you do look at this, the states don't have a lot of these tools, and even the federal government realized that this is a problem. That, that dollars that should be legitimately, really, in realistic terms, should be taxed in the US are kind of artificially, in a legal way, being transferred to these low tax. And it's a lot of this intellectual properties that are tough to keep track of. And so I do think there are some methods that we should do, and I think it's incumbent upon us, if we want a fair system, uh, to other businesses that compete that don't have the wherewithal. Uh, they're paying kind of the full freight. And, um, and, and actually, I don't, I mean, like I said, we've got good corporate partners in this state. And I know that they want uh, to do what's fair also. And, you know, the federal government tried to get at this, and this guilty is not a perfect system. The factors they use are kind of arbitrary. But there are ways in which the states can do that to make that work. So I... Whether or not it's the tax havens or not, I do think this is a huge issue. And I do think it's incumbent upon Minnesota after 35 years to try to look at some tools to recoup that, to create a fair tax system for everyone, other businesses and, and our families and our working families and senior citizens, farmers and so forth. So, Representative Hornstein. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that you really summarized the issue before us and, and I think that uh, uh, Representative Gomez framed it very well as well. So maybe there's some discomfort with lists. I understand that. But there is a fundamental question of fairness that's before us. This is a problem. This is an issue. Uh, it was identified in the TCJA. Um, I appreciate Representative David's last year. We worked together to at least get some of that deemed repatriation back. And, um, and, and you know, it was 50 million. I think there's more that we could get. And so um, the question really before us as legislators is what is the state level response? What is the state uh, tools that we have as a state to also start collecting this money? Because it should not be sitting there uh, in, you know, in these countries. And um, I think there's a, a fundamental tax and public policy issue before us. And so... I hope that uh, in this session, in the next few weeks, uh, whether it's this bill or some other uh, mechanism, we can figure out how to get more revenue that is rightly ours, that should be working for the people of Minnesota and not sitting in some bank overseas. That's the fundamental question. And I hope that together we can figure out the, the proper way to address this issue in state policy. And that's really what I'm trying to get at. And I think that was what you were trying to get at as well, Mr. Chair, because there is potentially lots of revenue that we could be collecting that we currently are not. Chair Davids. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think you, your comments were very appropriate. Well, obviously, you're the chairman, so of course they're <laughs> appropriate. But tax policy affects behavior. It affects behavior. So what we've found out today that we've already known is that money does flow to lower taxed areas. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, you said number one, Mr. Chairman's Bermuda. Ireland has to be up there a ways too. I think they're at 11%. I know billions of dollars from the United States go into Ireland. So they're taxed at 11%. I would request uh, to meet with Ms. Templin uh, sometime today because I want to know how you have a revenue note that has all this money coming in when there's no one on the list to get it from. That's something. Uh, and just so we know, just so we're clear, uh, Bermuda is the number one 
area where people are putting their money. And I just want you to know that the Better Business Bureau of Bermuda uh, rated the uh, Bermuda Bankers Association with a five-star rating. <laughs> Any, yeah, and <laughs> Chair Davids, I don't know if that's actually where most of the uh, taxes go. That was on this list of they had certain taxes where it was kind of out of whack with GDP versus, uh, and so I don't, and I think, like, um, like I know in Germany and France, the percent of the GDP that our profits there by U.S. companies is only like one half of one percent. So it might be more, but what they're talking about kind of the percent of the, the total GDPs. Did we have right here, Representative Swazinski? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you know, I just just want to remind you know we, it was brought up that you know the the businesses that are actually potentially taking advantage of this opportunity are larger businesses, ones that maybe have a little bit more wherewithal, a few more staff that can you know, help manage their assets in a way that is beneficial to their st stockholders, their customers, and the rest. And, you know, we've had the tax incident studies that, you know, we said it's an issue of fairness. It's an issue of what's right. We've heard that over, we want to be able to fund our schools. But if you look at the, the data when it comes to the tax incident studies that over and over again, we say, well, we want to go after business. Businesses are, by, in, by any... They simply collect taxes for government. So a corporation will simply pass the cost of the taxes on to their customers because that's what they do. 90%, 90 or 95% of taxes that are on business gets passed to the consumer. It's the tax incident study. It says there might be a caveat that says, well, Minnesotans maybe only pay 45% of that, but the other 45% of that gets passed to other customers around the state and other states. So this idea that they need to pay their fair share is simply, I mean, in, in some way or another, a, a, I would make the argument in big that a, a tax on a corporation is a regressive tax. No different than a gas tax, no different than a cigarette tax, no different than any other tax, a tax on clothes. Because you could, you could be taxing a, a corporation that makes clothing <clears throat> that has profit. Well, who's paying for that tax? The, 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 the mom, the dad, the single mother, uh, the folks that are trying to put shoes on their kids' feet, they're the ones paying the tax. It's the customer because they pass it along. So. Thank you. Any other comments on Representative Fabian? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I was uh, happy to hear your comments about uh, the business uh, partners that we have here in the state of Minnesota because <clears throat> For too long, a lot of those uh, businesses have been demonized by folks who accuse them of not, you know, being good neighbors and not paying their fair share and so forth. And I'm going to stand up for the business community, particularly in the district that I represent. I've got a couple of family-owned businesses up there that employ uh, 6,000 people. And the good that they do in the towns that they are based in and the counties that they're in is almost immeasurable. Can you imagine a family spending $26 million to build a senior living center? That's what they did in War Road. A family did that, that owns a company. A company that was started by some people that had a vision. And they employ lots of people. And they've been through some tough times during the housing market and people were working 30 hours a week. Nobody got laid off. Everybody pitched in, rolled up their sleeves together. And I'm just really, really proud of what the businesses do in, in Roseau in terms of helping out at the high school with all kinds of robotics and technology and welding and trades type of things that they do in our schools. And the same thing happens in Thief River Falls. These companies are awesome and they employ lots of people and the people really like the managers that they're working for. Um, I just am really disheartened when I hear the comments about these evil corporations. I just, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't ring in my neighborhood, it does not. And, um, you know, Representative Hornstein, you talked about a fundamental question, and there are several fundamental <laughs> questions. I, seriously, I'm interested in what conversations have you had with uh, CEOs or the corporations who are doing these things that, that, that you're saying that they're doing to get some insight from them to find out what can we do here in Minnesota with regards to tax policy that will get them to want to bring their money back here? Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Fabio. I just am aware of the fact that, um, you know, I look at the data and I see that uh, there is money that is, uh, you know, 
the certain Minnesota companies, and we don't, and, and the, the Department of Revenue knows who those companies are. We don't. There's a the issue, and I don't know if it's a, a policy or a law, but um, there are, we know there are some, some companies that are engaging in this practice, and uh, I wish I knew who they were, because then I could have that conversation, but I don't know who they are. It's not every company. It's likely not a family-owned business. I think it's some of the, the largest companies in the state. And uh, as someone mentioned, uh, they have the, the accountants and the expertise to, to figure out how to do this. Um, but if I knew who those companies were, I would love to have that conversation because the conversation I would have is, um, you know, you, you need to bring this money home. And that's what happened, in the ta that's what happened at the federal level. On a bipartisan basis, the TCJA recognized this problem. And as Chair Marquardt said, Hundreds of billions of dollars are coming home, and we need some money to come back to Minnesota. That's the conversation I would have. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Hornstein, why is that money now coming back? Because the government said you will bring that money back? Yeah, Representative Hornstein. My understanding in the, is that that's, that is a federal law that was passed on a bipartisan basis and signed by the president in late uh, 2017. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, but the reason that it got done and it was able to get passed, and I don't know that there were very many, if any, Democrat votes on it, was because, as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Chair, the, the tax rate on those dollars was lowered, and that was an encouragement to bring them back. So, so we got a bite out of the apple, and we didn't choke to death on the entire apple. Is that not correct? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Faber, I wish that that <laughs> wasn't a provision in the bill, but it was. Uh, and uh, I know that, many, that there was opposition to that provision. There was opposition. People wanted the status quo. Uh, but I think it was so egregious. I think there was a recognition that this was so egregious and that there was so much money being hidden overseas that something, something had to be done. <laughs> Representative Fabian. Thank you. There were other reasons, Mr. Chair and Representative Fabian, why Democrats didn't vote for it. I understand. It, it, I, I think that that provision might have been one that, that could have been more bipartisan. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Representative Hornstein, you know that you and I have a very, very good uh, relationship, both personally and professionally. And I'm, I'm being very serious when I say you don't know who the companies are. Listen, in, in my hometown, okay, I have this little company that started in 1954 by three people who had a vision. Okay? Today, that company is a Fortune 500 company that started in Roseau, Minnesota. My point is, is that I know you well enough to know that if you wanted to sit down with these people, the business leaders who are involved in our business community, that they would welcome an opportunity to come to your office and speak generically about this situation. And it doesn't, no disrespect to the people who are here testifying on their behalf, but I know that they would come to your office. So send out an invitation to them and talk to them. So, and, and Representative Fabian, I appreciate your comments and <clears throat> hopefully you didn't misconstrue mine. Is no. that, you know, I, as I said, we've got good corporate partners and, uh, you know, federal government and, you know, the president and both parties have said this is, is a concern. Kind of, you know, this, the fact that this profit shifting is causing lost revenue and it's totally legal, but it's, it's a loophole. I mean, there are things happening and those dollars, I knew, <laughs> I shouldn't have used that term. I'll get I where David's so going. I was not to, Mr. Chair. But, you know, that we could try to close. But the fact of the matter is a lot of these lost revenues hurt the competitiveness of some of these other businesses and some of these lost revenues would be used for funding that would help these corporations to train workers, to provide good roads, to move goods to market, to help fund broadband, which is a real economic driver. So it, it's kind of the balance on, on all of this. And just, you know, any tax code is trying to get as fair as you can possibly get, where people pay no more, no less than what they should. So, um, I, I mean, I just think there's some tools now that the federal government, in looking at this whole issue, has provided to the states uh, that are possible tools we can use. But, uh, 
I mean, uh, anyway, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, Representative Fabian. And I, and I told you at the very beginning, I really appreciated your comments because you were being complimentary to our business community, and I appreciate that. I really do. Thank you. And Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may. You may. Representative Hornstein, uh, when you schedule that meeting with these uh, leaders of these uh, Fortune 500 companies, <clears throat> I would be more than happy to sit in that room with you. Representative Hornstein. And uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Fabian, you know, I've had great conversations with the business community uh, about transportation issues uh, over the years, uh, including this year. Uh, we don't always disagree. Uh, or we always, uh, we, we tend to disagree. We don't always agree uh, on, on uh, issues around transportation. Uh, but there are many points of agreement, uh, maybe not uh, the revenue source that I'm interested in, in using to fund transportation. But there's, there is a lot of agreement around that issue uh, with the business community. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, some conversations around tax policy, which I de tend to not have with them, it's mostly around transportation, would be beneficial. Uh, but, you know, my point, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Fabian, is that for whatever reason, and I, it, it maybe uh, demands more investigation by us as a legislative body, that there is not a lot of transparency in, in terms of who those companies are. And I think it's a small number, uh, but we know that this, you know, my understanding is that uh, this does happen, and I, if I knew who those were, I would love to have that conversation. And it may not be the ones in your district. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a comment. I really appreciate, I think most people want to have, uh, that want to have an intellectual and authentic conversation really appreciate uh, your words, uh, Chairman of our corporations and our business partners, and uh, Chair Hornstein's. Uh, not, they were very careful in the words they choose. And I hear too often, I think we hear too often that they say, they're not paying their fair share. I think that's so unauthentic and unfair and not even an intelligent statement unless you truly know their tax returns. I know several businesses in Wright County, mean big corporations, that pay their fair share. Some of them are dear friends, so I know what they pay. I know what they pay in their tens of thousands of square feet footage manufacturing buildings that pay for property tax, that pay for roads and bridges and our education and the health care. So I've always rejected, and it's insulting when I hear people say, paying their fair share. Unless someone really knows what they pay, it's such an intelligent or unintelligent comment. So I appreciate your, your comments, uh, Chairman, uh, the kindness that you showed and the fairness to our corporations and business partners and Chair Hornstein's as well, not to throw out such a stupid statement as saying they don't pay their fair share. I think we should reject that and, and really have a more honest and authentic conversation and not say such Mr. things. Mr. Chair, po point, of, point, of, point of order, I don't think it's appropriate to um, state that the comments of another member on this committee were unintelligent. I don't know if that comment was made. No, I didn't say that, Mr. Chair. Oh. So, yeah, it was. All right. Very good. Mr. Chair, I never pointed out anyone in particular. I, I hear that word often. We hear that word often. So I was saying it's not a fair, intelligent statement unless one really truly knows what another individual or corporation pays. I, okay. So if I, someone was insulted by that, my dearest apologies. It was not my intention. Okay. I, members, just, yeah, I think well, we need to make sure we don't cast aspersions on uh, the, the quality of, of comments and so forth. But I... I, I did hear Chairman Section uh, of Mason Chair, Section One Chair David Four Paragraph Three do says Mason. that you cannot attack the person, but you may, in the strongest terms, condemn the issue. So that's Mason. So I didn't see where Representative McDonald was out of order in any way. He did not attack a person. He attacked a a, a statement in the strongest terms, and that wasn't even that strong. Um, well, I, so we we are in order com, uh, concerning Masons. Miss. Very good. And I know there's an objection has been raised, and I think rather than ruling one way or the other, I just would like to. Well, m Mr. Chair. State the members, just watch what they say. They're Representative Becker. In, in two Masons 124, it, you know, then it's fine to say that, um, that you disagree with the language. And it's fine to say that um, you think it's that the language of the bill is unfair. We're supposed to speak to the bill. But to state that um, the comments of a member themselves, you know, when somebody says, you know, that's just stupid or that's just intelligent is, is not appropriate. And I don't. Actually, it is. We speak to the bill, not to members. 
Represent Becker Finn, thank you for bringing that up and reminding members. So, uh, any further comments, uh, Representative Joachim? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank Representative Hornstein for bringing this bill forward and and having us have such an engaging conversation early in the morning. And just as a reminder, thank you, Mr. Chair, for for stating that civility should rule in this discussion. Otherwise, it's going to be really long until the end of session. And I would just ask members to choose their words wisely as well. And the comment was obviously directed at not just the intent, but Ooh. not the language of the bill, but a, a comment about a comment that was made. So we can disagree on that, and I'm sure we'll disagree on a lot of other things. But I would just kind of really beg that we'd have um, civility rule. And we always talk here in taxes about how <coughs> taxes can um, predict or push or move the way people interact with things and with the law, with money, and moving things around. And we all know that sometimes we have to do carrots out there to get people to actually do the right thing. That's what happens. Um, but I want to make sure that we understand that what we're trying to do here with this bill and other bills we're talking about is that we're trying to level the playing field for the businesses in your district, Representative Fabian. Because as I heard from other people, even on your side, they don't have the lawyers and the accountants to shift money all over the world, but they're trying to compete in a global society, especially with the ability to sell their goods and services on the internet and globally. So we want to make sure that it's a level playing field for them and that folks that maybe aren't doing, you know, using the tax code to ship money all over the world and make it so they don't have to pay all the taxes on it is truly unfair to our small businesses and our businesses on Main Street. So I know you like to think that we think corporations are evil. That is not the thing. We care just as much as you do about our communities and our business owners and our Main Streets. So just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Representative Fabian. How did you know, Mr. Chair? Your name was used. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Representative Fabian. You know, I, I appreciate the conversation here that we've had today as well. Um, and um, mm -hmm. in terms of leveling the playing field for the businesses in my community, whether they're the small Main Street hardware or that Fortune 500 company that I can see from the back window of my house, um, I have a lot of ideas for leveling the playing field. And we're competing, as you said, in an international global market. And when I look at the um, amount of uh, the amount of, uh, of, of uh, movement out of the state of Minnesota as a result of our tax and regulatory climate, I ask people, not rhetorically, but well, somewhat rhetorically, why is it that when a company that's in the district that I represent has the good fortune to grow? and expand and then want to increase and get even bigger, why do they choose to go to Grafton, North Dakota and Fargo, North Dakota for that expansion and not Crookston and Moorhead? And if you sit down and have that conversation with those people, they'll tell you why. It's because of tax and regulatory climate. And some people would say, well, it has to do with, with workforce. Chair Marquardt, you live in the Fargo-Moorhead area. What's the difference between the workforce that's available in Moorhead versus the workforce that's available in Fargo? And that's a rhetorical question, obviously. But I do, I do appreciate the conversation. And uh, um, I'm looking for ways to level the playing field. And I'm happy to work with Representative Joachim or Representative Hornstein or anyone. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just kind of, kind of piggyback. We talked about this, the fair share portion. and how this is potentially affecting our local businesses. By nature, you know, your own words, Mr. Chair, was talking about this is a, oftentimes intellectual property that is being shifted into some of these, these havens, essentially. And so what is that? It's, it's patents, it's ideas, it's by its own words, not a publicly, you know, discussed thing. So th these are things or ideas that have been developed and shared and by its own nature, owned by maybe one business. So there's not multiple businesses, multiple corporations, not Main Street businesses that own a patent. It's a single business. 
and to say that because that patent is being put into a, a tax haven by itself is somehow you know, shortchanging a local business is not necessarily true because a vast majority of intellectual property is property that is owned by a single entity because of its uniqueness, because of the patent surrounding it, the protection of it. You know, we really want to get after jobs and local jobs uh, from an international standpoint because this is an international issue that we're talking about. Uh, you know, we should be looking at, and I believe the president on a large extent is trying to make a difference, is looking at what China in Southeast Asia is doing to a lot of our patents, and they're robbing us blind. You know, they're taking our intellectual property, they're taking it from businesses. And part of that's our own fault from a manufacturing standpoint is because we are, as Representative Fabian mentioned, we are unfriendly. So we have businesses that, in order to compete on an international scale, have to look at third world countries or developing countries to find a market so that they can produce a product at a product and a cost that we can compete in on an international level. And you know we need to, to be looking seriously from a, uh, an American standpoint and a Minnesota standpoint to say, whether it be shrimp in southwest Minnesota that moves to South Dakota, uh, whether I mean, there are certain jobs that potentially can always be here. Mining, when you're looking at agriculture, when you're looking at things that are of the ground. But when it, when it comes to thoughts of the ideas and the marketability of, of patents and the things from an intellectual standpoint, those are things that truly we can capture uh, by creating a fertile ground to do it. And we do do it from an educational standpoint. We have a lot of development. We, you know, one of the bills we heard was an angel investor uh, tax credit. And those are the ways that we can help develop those relationships, making sure that those things stay here, start here, and maybe thrive here. Um, but it takes all three things to do it. We also have to have fertile ground in which to grow. We can create a seed, we can create an idea, but we also want to have a nice place for it to grow. And I believe tax policy is one of those areas that <coughs> fundamentally can make a difference, but then also on a regulatory basis that you know, if that business is going to go to the next level, this is going to be the next Fortune 500 company that it, it can actually do it here and not have so many encumbrances um, to do it. So there we go. Representative Petersburg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just want to go back to, you know, kind of what we're talking about here. And um, um, I think every governor that I'm aware of has made at least one, if not more than one, trip overseas to various countries trying to develop uh, in investments in Minnesota, uh, trade in Minnesota, and, and try to get companies to, to really come and, and invest in, in our state here as well. And I'm sure that the companies there uh, will look at our tax structure and, and all the information, find out how they could be competitive in this market, understanding the property tax values, uh, et cetera, and, and make those decisions uh, about what's there. And part of that would be how they're going to deal with profits and other things that, that are that are there. And so I think that's one area for us to consider. This is not just a comp easy solution where one size fits all. Uh, going beyond that, um, we may look at this as a windfall to the state. The dollar's going to come in. But the reality is that every business that I know of, uh, when their expenses go up, so do their costs and so do their prices that they charge. So eventually, all of this windfall that we see is going to come upon um, consumers taxpayers in one one form or another so where I say it's very complicated uh, it is it's kind of like a, a, a house of cards and we have to be careful how much we wiggle one a leg of that because it can can come down on us so I just ask us to to work cautiously and make sure that we do the, the right thing when all the things are put together and we come together with us with a solution there thank you mr. chair thank you representative O'Neill <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wanted to draw the committee's attention to something that was handed out by the pages at the beginning of the hearing. Um, and at the top, it says OFII. So it's the, um, inter the Organization for International Investment. And it was some of the similar concerns that was the testifiers came forward to say from Minnesota Chamber and so on. But as I was looking through the next page as a, a membership list. And I'm sitting here listening to the conversation and looking for Minnesota companies, and I, I found some. But one in particular that really stood out to me of the list of the Minnesota companies is one that does medical device. And why is that in particular interesting to me? Well, it is because I happen to know that there are uh, there's manufacturing facilities within my district that supply this particular company. 
And I visit there quite often. Uh, there's quite a few manufacturers in Minnesota. In my district, I actually have two of the five precision manufacturers that can tool to one to two micron tolerances, which is incredibly precise. So uh, there's one just outside. There's actually one um, up near, not quite in Fabian's district, but Representative Fabian's district has, uh, just outside has one. But in any case, so they are highly skilled. They've been there for a very long time, and they started off very, very small, as Representative Fabian had described. So as I visit these precision manufacturers that supply this very large corporation, we have very frank conversations about taxation, about workforce, and they commonly remind me that one out of six jobs in Minnesota is directly related to manufacturing. One out of six, that's a huge workforce here in Minnesota. So you're talking about a vast, a vast number of folks here in Minnesota. And you know, again, the, the company that is opposed to this bill is on this list. They are an international company. There are, their, their suppliers are many, many, many. I have suppliers in my district that supply this particular company. So I would just point that out, that this, this is far reaching. And if they're concerned about their competitiveness, which is another thing that I hear often from my manufacturers, that they are living on very thin margins, that they have to compete, not just in Minnesota, but they have to complete, compete nationally and globally to, to um, again, they are the precision manufacturers of Minnesota. There's only five. And uh, any change, any pressure, any, um, we talked about sort of this tax atmosphere or environment here in Minnesota. It will directly determine what they're going to do with their business. And they have grown into a very successful business in my district and employ a lot of people. So I just think that we need to be mindful and actually, you know, read the documents that were sent to us uh, or brought to us. Um, and it's interesting to see the names on the list, but one in particular, like I said, is, uh, is one that employs an awful lot of people and, and the suppliers employ an awful lot of people in Minnesota. So I think we should be mindful of that and, and pay attention to their concerns. Members, any other comments or questions? Representative yeah. Hornstein, any final comments? Well, thank you. This is an exciting committee. Um, I, uh, I appreciate the conversation a lot. I always learn from hearings, and um, I, I would just stand by, you know, my contention that, um, you know, tax havens exist. Uh, there are uh, Minnesota companies that are um, shifting money overseas. Uh, I do believe that uh, it is important that we uh, follow at least philosophically what has been done at the federal level and if there's a way in Minnesota tax policy and Minnesota public policy to repatriate all or part of those funds so they can work hard for the people of Minnesota uh, uh, developing a first-class education system making sure our people have health care making sure that we have a strong infrastructure those are the things that ultimately help our state and help businesses small and large Nonprofit, civic, uh, we need infrastructure for education, health care, transportation, and a clean environment. Uh, that's what creates jobs and that's what builds our economy. And that's what we do in our general fund here. So um, uh, I hope that moving forward, Mr. Chair and members, uh, we can find uh, uh, through research and, and um, uh, looking at uh, this issue a little more closely. We haven't had a good tax haven discussion for a few years, uh, but I do feel that given the changes in the federal tax law, uh, we need to see and really, really look closely at what we can do here in the state of Minnesota to repatriate this money so it works for all of us. So thank you very much for the conversation. Uh, and uh, I look forward to working with you and uh, members on both sides of the aisle to see if there's a way that we can move forward with this bill. Uh, perhaps in a changed form, uh, but with its intention the same, uh, to repatriate money back to the state of Minnesota that's in tax havens overseas. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Representative Hornstein, thank you for spending the time you did today with the committee. Uh, with that, uh, Representative Carlson renews his motion to lay over House File 1849 as amended for possible inclusion into the tax omnibus bill.
Representative Ornstein, thank, thank you. you so much. Members, thanks for the discussion.